Good morning. I want to say hello to everybody. I'm glad you're with us, and especially those who are listening on the radio. If you're watching by way of uh, Internet, we're grateful that you have decided to be a part of our class today. Uh, we'll begin in a prayer. Uh, we'll pray for those we have on our prayer list. Uh, Miss Melinda Brandon is still in the uh, Macon County General Hospital, so let's uh, remember her in our prayer. Also, uh, Paul Buck, how did his uh, procedure come out? Okay. All right, so continue with the test there. So let's uh, also remember him in prayer. Uh, Hayes Poston, of course, uh, we still have him on our prayer list. Don't know, I don't think that they've done surgery on him yet. Has anybody heard recently? Yeah, okay. That's what I heard, David, but that wasn't direct. And uh, after I preached last Sunday night about gossip, I've tried to be more careful about it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good deal. All right, we're glad to hear that. Uh, anytime you have to have surgery, whether you think it's minor or major, most of the time you think it's major, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I would. I heard that if they had decided to go the surgery route, it was going to be kind of intensive. So we're glad to hear he's not going to be uh, put under that kind of condition. Anybody else you know of this morning you'd like for us to remember in prayer? Of course, let's remember our graduating seniors. We have a list of those on the front of our bulletin there, and we'll remember them as they uh, are moving out of one phase of life into another phase. That's always a major uh, a major movement in a person's life. All of us probably can recall our graduation, though it may have been, uh, you know, back when they actually had sheepskin. And, uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, uh, we all probably remember that. Let's all bow in prayer now. Our Holy Father, we're thankful this morning uh, that you have blessed us with another day. We're especially thankful for this being the first day of the week as we assemble, as we come in this time of worship to honor and glorify your name, to lift up the name of Jesus as our Savior. Our Father, we come and we also pray for those that are sick and we ask that your blessings be with them. May they receive health and may they receive strength that comes from your hand. Holy Father, we're grateful that you are with us each and every day of our lives in so many ways. You're always there. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your promise and thank you for your power. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now let's look in Matthew chapter 27 as we continue to look at the story here of Judas. And uh, we concluded last week in about the middle of verse 4. So we'll just kind of pick up and just uh, for those of you who maybe weren't here, didn't have an opportunity to be a part of the class last week, we'll just bring you up to speed with the rest of us here. Starting in verse 1 and verse 2, you have uh, the mentioning here of the uh, same Sanhedrin uh, at daybreak taking Jesus to the house of Pilate, taking him to be judged before the Romans. And then you have this interlude that takes place starting in verse 3, going through about verse 10, which is the story of, uh, of, uh, of Judas. And I spent some time last week before we ever got into the text talking about suicide. Um, and you can go back, I think, and I, I think that do they keep this recorded? Are you able to go back uh, and pick that up, uh, Corey? Can you do that? Okay, so you can do that if you want to. Uh, you can go back and, and pull up last week's uh, lesson and see what we talked about on the issue of suicide there. But then I got more into the text, and what I told you as we looked at it, when Matthew records for us the story of Judas, it's not just to make the story uh, more interesting. It's not to add drama to the story. There's a purpose behind uh, Matthew recording this text and recording it where he does and the way he does. 
And what he's trying to do here is to, by way of contrast, teach us uh, an important lesson about the character uh, and the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he does that through uh, these pictures, these word pictures here, and the events surrounding Judas. And I told you last time that there is this contrast that we see between the unjust leaders and the sinlessness of Christ. Uh, uh, you see that in verse 1 where they came together at, at the daybreak, and the reason why they did that is because they'd already judged Jesus to be guilty. Uh, they'd already accused him of blasphemy, which wasn't actually blasphemy at all because he's telling the truth. He is the Son of God. But nonetheless, they accuse him of blasphemy. And in order to justify that, they have to meet the court at daylight or during the daylight hours. And so that's why they... They actually convene the court legally then, and they do it in the court, uh, the judgment seat place. And so you have these unjust leaders who are trying to justify themselves, and the contrast here, of course, with Jesus. And then we looked last week also at the contrast between guilty Judas and the innocent Christ, innocent Jesus. And uh, we saw how Judas had made his plans and how he had taken the silver from the chief priests. Uh, he meets, apparently he must be following nearby somewhere. He witnesses what's going on, so he has to be somewhere nearby in the vicinity. And he goes in verse uh, uh, 3, he saw how he had betrayed the innocent Jesus. He is seized with remorse, this translation says. I talked about, the King James says he repented, and we talked about exactly what that means. It doesn't mean that he turned from his sin so much as he was sorry for that. Um, our court system and our jail houses all across America are full of people who are sorry. And I don't mean in character. They're sorry for their uh, act of what they've done. And what they will tell you probably is they got, they're sorry they got caught. And there's a big difference between the two. And so uh, here's Judas. He is uh, of that sort. He's not really repentant of, of sin. And so he goes to return these 30 pieces of silver to the elders, uh, to the chief priests, and he makes this confession. He says, I have sinned. But he doesn't actually repent in a way to say that God's going to forgive him. He says, I have sinned because or for I have betrayed innocent blood. Now, <clears throat> He, he makes this statement here, and like I said, it's a statement of, of remorse. He, he acknowledges what he has done is wrong, but he doesn't go to God. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't ask God for forgiveness. He doesn't do any of that. He just simply says, I have sinned. And notice this part here in verse 4 I want you to see, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Now, notice that statement there. He says, I have betrayed innocent blood. He did not say, and this is the important part, he did not say here that uh, Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't make any kind of statement about that. I don't think he ever came to that conclusion. I don't think he ever really believed that in his heart, that Jesus was the Son of God. He was innocent of the charges that they were trying to bring against him but not that he is the Son of God. He doesn't make that comment. He doesn't make that statement at all, simply that he is an innocent person. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's where it comes in. Jewish prudence in Jewish law said that the court was to convene, especially if a person was to be uh, convicted of a capital punishment where they were going to be put to death. The court had to be convened for three days. And during that three-day period, if anybody, there was the day in which the person was pronounced guilty and his sentence, then there's the uh, following day, and then the day following that is the day the execution is to take place. Well, you can see right off that's not going to happen here. But the court is supposed to be convened during that time so that if any new evidence comes up, if a witness comes up and says, you know, I lied or I have uh, misrepresented the truth here, 
they were supposed to retry the person. They were to convene, keep the court convened. That person was supposed to be brought back and another trial uh, uh, proceed from there. That's not what happens here. When Judas comes and he says, I have betrayed innocent blood, at that point, the Jewish court was supposed to say, okay, we've got to stop this. We've got to freeze it and have another trial. They didn't do that. What they do? Here's what they did. They said, what's that to us? They didn't care. They didn't care about Judas. They certainly didn't care uh, about Jewish prudence here, following the law and being legal to, to that point where they can, uh, you know, find Jesus to be innocent. What they say is, what's that to us? And they say to him, this is simply your responsibility. You take care of it. Well, no, it's not. Uh, so in this process here, <coughs> this is where... Um, the people could have called for impeachment of the Sanhedrin. Um, I know, you know, we hear some talk today in our country about impeaching the president, impeaching the president. Well, in this case, you could actually have impeached the Sanhedrin because they were so illegal in their maneuvering here and so obvious in, in what they were intending to do. It would have been easy for any court to have found them guilty and to uh, thrown all of them out of office, the whole Sanhedrin, uh, if they had chosen to do so. That would have been 71 people counting the high priest. So they could have done that, but they didn't. Now, what is Judas going to do about this? How is he going to respond? Well, it says in verse 5, So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. He went away and hanged himself. Now, I want you to see something here. The picture here may be that they are at the temple, and uh, he is there in their presence, and he throws this money at their feet. And probably you have seen movies uh, uh, or, you know, quote-unquote documentaries that show Judas throwing this money at the feet of the high priest, but that's not actually what happened. Now, the word temple here has actually two words uh, in the Greek uh, for the word temple. One word is the word uh, harion. Harion. And the word harion is a word which refers to the temple total. The courts, all the land, all the property, all the buildings surrounding that was called the temple, and when they would talk about that, they would use the word harion. Now, if they were going to talk about the holy place, or the most holy place, they used another word, and it is the word nalos. The word that's used here now in your translation, if you look at it in verse 5, the word that's used there for temple is the word nalos, not the word harion which specifically refers to the most holy place, the holy of holy place, where the only people that could go in there were the priests, the high priest, and the most holy place. And so you have the holy place and the most holy place. So what does Judas do? Well, what he does is, is that he leaves when they tell him, that's your responsibility, you take care of it. He leaves. He goes to the temple. He goes through the court uh, of the Gentiles. He walks through the court of the women. He goes through the court of the men. He goes to the most or to the holy place. At the holy place, he then takes and he throws the money into the most holy place. He's not allowed in there, but he can throw money. In. He can throw it in, you know, at the curtain and it fall in and toward the most holy place. So that's what he does here. Now, the question is, why did he do that? Well, somebody said the reason why he did that is because it's an act of charity. What he wants to do is he wants this money to go toward the poor. Well, if he'd wanted that, he wouldn't have done it in this way. He would not have taken the money and thrown it in the place that he threw it in. There were plenty of places around about where he could have dropped the money in to be used specifically for the helping of the poor, but he doesn't do that. So why does he do what he does? He does it out of spite. That's why he does it. 
He does it out of spite because he knows that the only people who can actually pick up this money, the priest and the high priest, they're the only ones because they're the only ones who can get in there. And so he leaves it there. And then he, the Bible says he goes out and he hangs himself. Now you remember last week I told you there are five cases where people take their lives recorded in the Bible. Two of those are classified as classic suicide acts. The others are debatable. There are surrounding circumstances around those that one could maintain and argue that they're not actually suicide. For example, Samson. Samson took his own life, but it was an act of sacrifice and not an act of suicide. So that's one case. But anyways, there are two cases. One of those is here. Judas hangs himself, and another fellow by the name of Ahithophel. And Ahithophel is an Old Testament character who betrayed David. Now, what's interesting about these two cases, both hung themselves, and both were betrayers of people close associates. Judas betrayed Jesus, Ahithophel, he betrays David. They both hang themselves, they're both betrayers. Now, why does he do that? Why does he hang himself? Why didn't he go out and just throw himself off a cliff? There are plenty of places where he could have jumped to his death. Uh, he could have taken poison. He could have taken a spear. That's what Saul did, you remember. Uh, there are lots of ways a person can commit suicide than just hanging themselves. And the reason I think I would give about that is because of an Old Testament a passage that Judas would have known very well, and we know as well, but we know it in a different context. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Now, this passage is used later on in the book of Galatians by Paul. So Jews would have known this passage very well. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. So what Jews believed was is that the act of hanging was actually an act of, of being cursed by God. And that's how Paul uses it in the book of Galatians. Uh, God cursed Jesus on our behalf. That's the point that Paul's trying to make there. But to the Jew, for a person to be hung was considered that God had cursed him. And so when Judas hangs himself, and also Ahithophel, who hangs himself, uh, I think that what's the process in their mind of what they're thinking is, is that this is the ultimate punishment that I can bring upon myself. Because in this act of hanging myself, I can say that God has cursed me. And so his guilt is so overwhelming. He is so remorseful for what he has done acknowledging what he has done to the point where he is saying, I am willing to be cursed by God. And so he, he hangs himself. Uh, and a Jew would have immediately picked up on that idea and thought as he thought about uh, Judas's demise and how he must have been cursed by God. <coughs> so he is inflicting punishment on himself for what he believes that he deserves. Now, he went to the high priest uh, and said to the high priest, I have betrayed innocent blood, right? It just so happens that they're in the process now of leading Jesus to Pilate when he stops the high priest. Jesus is only a few feet away. And my point I'm trying to make here is he went to the wrong person. Instead of going to the high priest, where should he have gone? To Jesus, exactly. He should have gone to Jesus. He should have asked Jesus to forgive him. That wouldn't have stopped the process, but it certainly would have changed his destiny. But he doesn't do that. He went to the wrong person. And so often that's the case for so many people when they're trying to seek and find relief from their guilt. You know, you go to a psychologist, you go to uh, someone who's trying to help you deal with your guilt, and what does he tell you? 
Well, here's a man who's guilty, who feels guilty because he cheated on his wife. Now his wife left him, and he's lost everything, and he's really feeling guilty now. And so the psychologist tells him, well, what you need to do is go out and commit more adultery. And that way you can harden your conscience and you won't feel guilty anymore. That's how they deal with it in modern day issues. You go to the wrong person. If you got an issue of guilt, who do you go to? You go to God, right? You go to Jesus. You let him deal with it. Uh, but Judas doesn't do that. And so here he is now and he hangs himself. Now here's the tragedy of all this. Death doesn't deal with sin. Death doesn't relieve the guilt. Death doesn't relieve the misery. Death doesn't relieve the, uh, the pain that's there. The only thing that death does in an act like this is that it makes that permanent. So on the day that he died and the day he hung himself to this very day today, he is in misery and punishment. Now, I want you to look at a passage with me, if you don't mind, Tony. Let's look over in Acts chapter 1, verse 18. I want to deal with a little passage here that some people see a conflict. Uh, not really a conflict at all, but people see this, and, and, and so when they see this, they, you know, they want to cast dispersions on the Scriptures. And they say, I see a conflict here. It can't be the Word of God. Now, in Acts chapter 1, telling us, of course, Jesus has already been resurrected. He's about to ascend into heaven. And uh, <coughs> it's telling us about what happened to Judas. Well, it says in verse 18 here, with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Now, see, that's a little different account, isn't it? of how Judas died. It says there he fell and his, and his entrails fell, uh, spilled out on the ground. What happened most likely is, is that he hung himself, as the scriptures teach us he did, and then it's 43 days later. Um, and it tells us then that I think what happened was is probably the limb broke or the rope broke, maybe both, and his body fell from the limb where he was hanging, and it hit the rocks and burst open, and uh, he was already dead. Now, <clears throat> go back with me here to this passage right here. There's no conflict at all. Uh, just simply describing more of the process of what happened to Judas. Verse 6, the chief priests picked up the coins and said it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. Now I want you to see this. They get there, they get to the temple. When they finally get to the temple, uh, they see the money. They know where the money came from. They acknowledge, they realize what it is. And look at what, they, what they're saying, what, the, what they're saying here. They said this is blood money. Oh, stop right there. What is blood money? Is that money with blood on it? Literally? <laughs> no. It's a figure of speech. That's exactly right. A figure of speech saying that the money that was used here was used to bribe in order to take the life of another person, a person who's innocent. Now, what's so amazing about this? Who made this statement? Yeah, it was the priest and the high priest. The chief priests, they acknowledge this as blood money. Well, you see what's going on here. Well, you, you got all these testimonies going on now. You've got Judas saying, this man is an innocent man. Now you got the priests out of the very mouths of those who wanted to kill him and accuse him of blasphemy, now saying it's blood money. Well, all these statements are accumulating. That's what Matthew's doing. He's accumulating all these testimonies, if you will, of the fact that Jesus was not guilty. He was completely innocent. Now, look, they had tried him all night long. They had tried to find some way, somehow, to find some kind of charge against him. Don't you know, you know, Judas was full of remorse, right? <clears throat> what does a man do when he's feeling guilty? 
Well, what his natural response is to try to find something to justify his guilt, to justify his act. Well, I don't know about you, but if I were in Judas's spot, what I would have been doing was I would have been racking my brain. I would have been trying to think of everything and every experience I'd had with Jesus and whatever it was I knew about Jesus. I would try to find something that would say, well, I was right when I betrayed him. Did Judas do that? Could he find that? No, he couldn't find it. It wasn't there. Now here comes along the testimony of these priests. And out of their very mouths they say, this money is blood money. And then, of course, they make this very hypocritical statement. It is against the law. We must put this in treasury. The word treasury there is the word corbanus. You remember when Jesus says you call it corbin? The word there is corbanus. We can't put this in the treasury. We can't do that. That's not legal for us to do. And so they are being very hypocritical now. They're really, really concerned about the law now. So this blood money was money that was illegitimately used and paid to kill somebody. And so they do that. Now, <coughs> what do they do with it? Well, it says to us here in verse 7, so they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. So they buy this potter's field. Now, a potter's field is a field or a place, a section of land, where the clay has been scraped off to use make pottery. And when you scrape off all the top with the clay, you got nothing left. It's just all subsoil and rock. You ever try to raise a crop on that, Cody? <laughs> it's not any good, is it? It's not so it's it's worthless piece of property is what it is. It's very inexpensive. And so why do they have this piece of property in case they want to bury any foreigners? You see, the Old Testament commanded that you're supposed to treat foreigners in the country respectfully. Well, if somebody who's, a, say, a Gentile comes into Jerusalem and he's there, and of course this would have been the case with the Romans, uh, and dies, now you've got to do something with the body. What are you going to do with the body? Well, let's take it out and bury it out there at that place. It's a worthless place. That's all it's good for. So we'll, we'll, we'll buy the potter's field. That's what we'll do, and we'll use it uh, for that. And so the Bible tells us that they buy this <coughs> piece of land, this worthless piece of land for, for, with the blood money. Now, the, sec the third thing I want you to see, the third contrast here is the hypocrisy of men versus the prophecy of God. Look down at verse 8 now. This is why it has been called the field of blood this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. All right, now, you have this place, and in, in verse 8 it tells us, called the field of blood. Well, that was what the people called it. That's what the, the general populace called it, was the field of blood. How they know it was the field of blood? They connected it with Judas. It was Judas. I mean, if you have a man hanging from a tree, and he's hung there now for 43 days before he finally falls, the body finally falls from the tree. People walking by, somebody's going to ask, who in the world is that? Why haven't they taken care of him? Somebody says, that's Judas. He hung himself. We don't want anything to do with that. He's accursed of God. Let him rot. That began to spread until finally, uh, years later, you have people still calling it the field of blood. So anytime you have Judas connected here, you have him connected in the minds of the people with blood money, uh, the shedding of innocent blood. So the testimony of, uh, of Judas couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus. The testimony of Pilate can't find anything wrong with Jesus. The testimony of the Sanhedrin can't find anything wrong with Jesus. The population, 30 years later, can't find anything wrong with Jesus. 
Now verse 9. You have the hypocrisy of men and the prophecy of God. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> if you have a center reference Bible, it should refer you to where? Zechariah? Okay, Zechariah was verse chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11, 12, and 13. If you want to turn over and look at it, you can. <clears throat> It changes. Translation changes in the Hebrew. There are sections of Scripture in the Old Testament. I'm referring in the Old Testament now. There are sections, not many. I think there's only two or three sections in the Old Testament where the Bible is not written in Hebrew, but it's written in Aramaic. And so there are times where the Holy Spirit changes things. Now, he has a right to do that. He's the Holy Spirit and the author of Scripture, so he can do that changes things well you have Zechariah here somebody says hold on I thought it says Jeremiah it does so isn't there another conflict here what, what, what's going on here okay let me try to explain to you what's going on Jews when they referred to the Old Testament oftentimes broke the Old Testament down into different sections I mean we do the same thing ourselves uh, in reference to the New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, they broke it down oftentimes into three sections. The first section is what they call the law. Of course, you know the law. The law covers what? Five books of the Bible. Anybody know? All right. First five books, right? What is known as the Pentateuch. And so you have the law. That's one section. And then the next section, by the way, Jesus does this in Luke. In Luke, I think it's 24. Let me see my, if I wrote that down. Yeah, Luke 24, 44, Jesus does the same thing. Now you have the law, the first five books of the Bible. Then following that, what you have, what the Jews call the prophets. And then Jesus says, you have the third section, which is what? Anybody know? Called, Jesus called it the Psalms. Now, in these three divisions, Jewish rabbis and teaching, of course, their congregations and the, their, their disciples, teach them about the Old Testament. You have the law. Sometimes it's called the law of Moses. Sometimes it's just called the law. Um, in writings today, it's called the Pentateuch. Sometimes it's called the Decalogue. Uh, sometimes simply called the law, the law of Moses. And then you have the prophets, and the prophets cover both major and minor prophets of, of the Old Testament. In the Psalms, you have the wisdom, what's called the wisdom literature. Now, the wisdom literature, or sometimes it's called the writings. That's even referred to, the writings. Now, in the Psalms section, you have not only the book of Psalms, you also have the Proverbs. You have the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, can you think of another one? Song of Solomon, that's exactly right. Those books were all classified in the book of Psalms. And so even though they called them Psalms, they were different books, but they were all the category of wisdom literature, all right? Now, rabbis also taught, and this is also taught in the Talmud, which is a, a commentary by the Jews on the Old Testament. They also called the prophets Jeremiah. And so what they would do is they would refer to the Bible as the law, Jeremiah, the Psalms. And, of course, Jeremiah referred to all the prophets. Jeremiah being seen by some as the greatest of the prophets. He prophesied during the time of the fall uh, of, of Israel into Babylonian captivity. He wrote the book of Lamentation at that time, so on and so forth. And so you have uh, Jeremiah. Now, uh, rabbinical uh, schools all recognized that, and they all taught that. 
So now when you have Matthew who refers to here in verse 9 when he says, then what was spoken by Jeremiah, is simply a reference to the prophets and particularly to the prophet Zechariah here. So there's no contradiction here at all. Uh, it's simply a way in which they refer to the prophets in general as in a category. Now, again, all this is saying this. Jesus is innocent. Uh, in the testimony of, of all, in the experience of all in this trial, <coughs> and with Judas and, and with, with everyone, Jesus is exalted. He is innocent. Now, they were thinking that they were doing the work of men. But all the while, they were simply following the plan of God. God can take any evil and use it toward his, uh, toward his will being done in the world. And so that's what's going on here now. So that's the interlude as we have it here. Now, starting in verse 11, and I'll just briefly introduce this. Starting in verse 11 through verse 26, we have the trial of Jesus now brought to the section of Pilate. Now, look down at verse 22. The most important verse in all of this is the verse in verse 22 where Pilate says, Then what shall I do with Jesus? And that is, boy, that's a powerful question. Uh, there's an old comment that's made something along the lines that you can get a sermon up that's so powerful that it'll preach itself. Well, here's a sermon that'll preach itself. What shall I do with Jesus? And, and that's what Pilate asked. That's the question. And it's not only a question he asked of the Jews, but it's one that he asked of himself, and it's one that we should all ask ourselves. It is the most serious uh, question to ever be asked and answer. Now, <clears throat> when Pilate asked the question, he asked the right question, but he got the wrong answer, and he gave the wrong answer. Now, to set us up here for what's going on here with Judas, we actually need to go back to verse 1 and verse 2. As I said, verse 3 to 10 is an interlude. So go back up to verse 1 and, and, and lead us down now to verse 11. Verse 1, they have this quick trial problem. It's like 5 o'clock in the morning now. Uh, they wait till daybreak. They have to be daybreak. So it's probably 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they hurriedly go through this trial. Probably doesn't last over 10 minutes. And then they are going to take Jesus to Pilate because you know, they cannot execute Jesus. Uh, they cannot take him out and crucify him themselves. Somebody says, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they do the same thing to Jesus they did to Stephen? You remember what they did to Stephen in the book of Acts? Uh, they took him out and they stoned him to death. Well, there's a difference in what the Sanhedrin's trying to accomplish and in what a mob does. What happens to Stephen is a mob. What the Sanhedrin is trying to do here is be legal in all their maneuvering. Well, we'll stop there, and we'll pick up next week in verse 11.